All right, welcome everyone to our July CCRA uh, RCO meeting. We have five projects tonight, and I hope that we can be expeditious in reviewing all of them. Uh, first, I want to just talk about the format of the meeting in case you're not familiar, um, and then talk about CCRA in general for a second. If you are not familiar with CCRA, we are the RCO that represents Center City, and we are uh, responsible for reviewing all variance cases that come before the Planning Commission. So tonight for the format of the meeting, we will be hearing the cases and uh, I will be calling, hold on, I gotta let some people in, excuse me. I'm uh, chairing by myself, so that's why it's gonna be a little bit cumbersome. Be patient with me. All right, now we have 50 participants. It's very exciting. Um, <clears throat> the format of tonight's meeting will be as follows. Each participant, each applicant will present their cases to the committee. I will then ask the committee as a whole to let me know if they have any questions. Then after the committee has delivered questions to the applicant and responses have been given, the public will have a chance to ask their questions. After that, I just want you to know that um, we have your cases presented. The, when we go through all of the cases, the CRA zoning committee will go into a closed session. And during that time, we discuss the merits of the case and we decide not in favor of a case necessarily, but to either oppose or not oppose the case. We deliver our results then to the representatives at the city who need to know and also the council folks who need to know so that when you come to your zoning hearing, the results of our deliberations are delivered in due course. You should know that if you do not uh, receive the exact result that you want this evening and you would like to be uh, heard, you should attend the zoning, commission, the zoning committee meeting, the ZBA hearing, excuse me, the ZBA hearing for each case. And with that, um, let's begin our first case. The first case will be 2118 Pine Street. It's ZBA number MI20220012169. The hearing date is August 3rd, 2022 at 2 p.m. Who is here to represent that case? I am. Henry Clinton. Very good. Henry, if you wouldn't mind, um, could you please also begin your presentation by reading the refusal? And then going, go ahead and present uh, the materials that the applicant has and you have prepared. Okay. Uh, first Henry, like I, Henry, I'm so sorry. I, I hate to in, interrupt you. Um, Janice, we, we, had, we had talked about maybe shifting the agenda because I have another meeting that starts at 730 and I, I didn't know if that would still be possible. So I'm going by the agenda that we prepared. And if uh, Mr. Clinton wants to uh, give up his post position, he may do so out of courtesy. Henry, what do you say? Sure. All right. Thank you. Jerry, thank, thank you very so much, much for reminding I'll be, me. And here I'll, we be, go. I'll be very brief, Hank. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay. Is it, is it okay if I just dive right in? Uh, well, Are we starting all, which one? Yes, exactly. What is your address, please? Uh, it the, is for, uh, for 233 South 24th Street. Okay, let me just read the calendar number for the public and also the hearing date. MI 2022-002205, hearing date 8-3-2022 at 2 p.m. Okay, Thank you very much. I, I uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Clinton allowing me to dive in and for taking me first. I'm double booked. Um, I'll be very, very brief because uh, this is a project that I think most people in the neighborhood are familiar with. Um, the address is 233 South 24th Street. It's the corner of 24th and Locust. Uh, and it is located right next door to the existing location for the Ambrosia BYOB restaurant. Uh, what Ambrosia is looking to do uh, is expand their indoor dining capacity into this structure at, at 233 South 24th that's located directly adjacent to their existing main, main building. Uh, and the idea is to use uh, the structure that's there now 
uh, for office space on the second floor and for additional dining space on the ground floor. Um, the, the restaurant itself is going to continue on as people in the neighborhood know it. Uh, at this point, we do not have plans for outdoor seating on 24th Street, just the outdoor seating that is there now. Um, but there is a rear courtyard and yard space in the back of 233 that might be utilized in, in the future. Uh, this really is trying to give uh, Am Ambrosia uh, additional square footage to be able to increase their, their seating capacity there. Luckily, a successful restaurant that survived COVID and they want to be able to continue offering the service for, for the neighborhood. Um, as I am talking, maybe Marty, who is running the slide stream, Marty, can you just flip through and show some, some of the pictures, please? Uh, as I just briefly described, there, there's the property there. Um, located immediately to the right of this is a small breezeway alley, which separates this structure from the next block of structures. Um, we have spoken to some people on the block and understand that uh, they're generally supportive of Ambrosia. Um, but there's always, there's always a concern about uh, noise and odors. And I just wanted to reassure everyone, we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that any impact from expanding into this structure is minimal to those of you who are living you know, immediately around the site now. Um, Marty, can you please flip to the floor plans and the renderings just so I can show people how the layout might look. So very, very basic. As you can see, it's just a single family house. It's being converted on the ground floor for additional restaurant seating. And as Marty scrolls through, you'll see some conceptual renderings that are colorized to show what the interior of the space will look like when this is all complete. Um, Marty, you can go two slides more, please. Perfect. That, that is con conceptually what they're looking at for the interior of that, of that space. Um, I know that the owners of Ambrosia should be on the Zoom. Uh, so if people have any specific questions about the operation, they're here. Um, and with my promise to be brief and my thanks to Hank for letting me line cut, I, I will stop there and open it up for questions and comments. Thank you very much for that uh, eclipsed <laughs> presentation. All right, um, I'd like to ask the committee now if they would uh, come forth with their questions. I do not want to do a roll call due to the length of this agenda. So uh, I would ask that you raise your hand or text me if you have a question about this application. Charles Robin, thank you, you're first. Will the kitchen remain the same? Yes. Will the venting remain the same? The venting is planned to remain the same, but if the community has a concern with existing venting, we're certainly happy to, to look at that. Thank you. Any else from the committee? Flora? I have no questions. Ben? Yeah, I, I remember that we have received over the years uh, a number of complaints from residents about uh, trash, the way it's stored or disposed, or noise. I don't remember the specifics of them, but I do remember that Ambrosia has generated a number of complaints. Uh, I don't know if there are people who are residents or nearby who are on this meeting who would like to speak to that. Um, I just remember that we have received a number of those, and I don't know what the details of them are at this point or how they've been resolved, if they've been resolved. Yeah, I know that there were some complaints with regard to the outdoor dining sort of that expanded as, as COVID began. Um, I think that they've made some efforts to construct more of a structure on the, for this streetery that's uh, reduced some of the noise. Um, and we're hopeful then that the, the, the breezeway that's located uh, immediately adjacent will diminish any, any noises or vibrations that are coming through the restaurant space. I do see some people raising hands who look like they must be neighbors because they're not on the committee. Okay. It's okay, Ben. There's still one more member of our committee who has not been able to ask a question. Ben Weinrob, would you like to uh, continue? Yeah, just a question about uh, our ongoing challenge to green in terms of trees. I know there's an open yard. Are you paving over that open yard for potential seating? Are we adding any trees or greenscape, green roof, et cetera? Uh, there's not going to be a green roof. Um, I, I believe the intention is to have seating in that outdoor courtyard, um, but I can let the owners clarify if they're on. If, if George or Freddie wants to wants to raise their hand, they can 
they can clarify that for us. Jared, I'm expecting them to do so, uh, and, and I won't move on until they have a chance to unmute themselves. And it's, it's possible they experience some technical difficulties getting in. Um, uh, if, if it helps, I'm a neighbor who lives directly adjacent to their building. The backyard of the building they're purchasing, as well as all other buildings that are along the 24th Street that have backyards, have extremely large trees that provide shade and coverage for that area. So it, it as is, has excellent greenery coverage. Uh -huh. uh, in no existing structures that I can see, and we have a six-story building, so we have a pretty good vantage of all other structures in the area. No one has any greenery on their roofs. Right. Does the person who is just speaking identify himself? Martin Lair. Martin Lair of 249 South 24th Street. And he was, just to clarify that, Bob, answering a question that the committee asked, and we still do have members of the committee who need to finish, and that would include Douglas Miller, please. I'd like to know what the neighbors are thinking. Have you, have you canvassed the neighborhood? Um, we, we have, and we spoke to the residents of uh, Fittler 9 that's located immediately adjacent and received a positive response. Just, just that one? I mean, there are other uh, neighbors. Well, th there's, a, there's a large apartment building that is catty-cornered to us. I, I haven't spoken to, to, to those folks, but the Fittler 9 townhomes we, ha we have connected. So you sent out letters to everybody in the neighborhood nearby? Yes. yes. And have you gotten any negative re responses? Uh, I have not received any ne negative responses, no. We, um, we might don't, have, sorry? We, we might have a few if residents are open to speak. They yeah. will be, Martin, okay. as, soon as we go to the second part of the meeting. And I just want to encourage folks to consider the etiquette of the uh, structure of the meeting in that I'm hoping that we don't have people pipe up until that time has occurred. Having been a control freak now, <laughs> I shall say, we have one, two, three, about five folks with their hands raised from the neighborhood. And so I'll just go through in no particular order, but please be assured if I miss you and I didn't call on you, you should then pipe up. All right, let's start with Megan Robb. Hey everybody, uh, this is Megan Robb and I'm uh, Terry Scott. Uh, we're neighbors of uh, 233 and 231. So actually our property abuts both of those properties. So our backyard shares the backyard of 231. Um, so we've, we've actually prepared a statement opposing uh, the appeal and have some material that we could share. Um, either, we don't usually either. typically allow for uh, opposing folks to share material. So let me ask you this. Um, and I, if the committee wants to entertain it, I can be overruled, but tell me why you need material. Is there something about your verbal statement that could not be conveyed unless you have graphics? Um, well, it probably gives evidence, kind of visual evidence to the words. Um, so. Could I ask you first then to like, state what your objections are and then uh, we'll see what we do, can do. Because sure. again, we, we, if we allowed presentations for opposition, we would off, often be late into the evening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, shall I start? Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for giving me a chance to talk about the impact that this decision, um, if it were rezoned, would have on a, our quality of life. Um, I think there's a couple of uh, general reasons that I think apply to everyone in the neighborhood. This is a historical residential neighborhood and the property being considered for rezoning is like our house, part of the Rittenhouse Fittler Square Historic District. And we strongly believe that expanding the restaurant would negatively impact the essential character of the neighborhood and negatively impact residents who live here. Um, and in the past two years, um, we've observed that Ambrosia Restaurant is really reluctant to both respect neighbors' concerns about noise 
and also reluctant to respect the property boundaries of neighboring properties like ours. Um, so in our case, they placed a streetery booth directly in front of our front door without our permission for over a year and a half. And we were going to show a picture of this um, just so you could see just how invasive it was. And only with a written notice from us that we were planning to pursue legal action did they remove it um, a month or two ago. And even now the streetery is visible and audible from every room and every front window of our house. And we can hear the restaurant in every room of our house since the expansion after COVID. There's no clear waiting room area for customers, leading customers to use the front of our home as a waiting area. And when we asked the owners, George and Freddie, to address the problem, they were reluctant to do anything and often were uncivil. And I expect that if the restaurant were to expand, the new neighbors would encounter the same issues that we have faced. And in fact, we have pictures that show that on the existing streetery that they have on 24th Street, they're already going over the property line to encroach on the properties on the other side. Um, and I, although we received a letter from the lawyers, I want to point out that the lawyer, the, the letter arrived on Friday afternoon. That was less than two business days ago. And the Zoom link on the letter from the lawyer is wrong. If we had depended on this link, we would have missed this meeting. And they also were obligated to post a very large, very brightly colored usually sign informing neighbors of this decision 21 days ago. We have photographic evidence that it was not posted until at the earliest 13 days before the hearing. And when it was posted, it was just two little pieces of white paper. We're just concerned that there's a pattern of not respecting neighbors um, and when it impacts our lives negatively, not respecting our concerns. Um, and so we're really worried about the decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting yeah. us talk. Megan, would you, if you could, I, I'm not looking for multiple pictures, but if you could show the one picture that shows where you're and also state your address. Absolutely. Our address is 2322 Locust Street. Um, is it okay if I share my screen to show you the picture? Yeah, I'd like to see that one picture about the relationship of your front door to the streetery, please. Our front door to the streetery. Okay. Yes. Described a picture that you were the, where the restaurant was. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. So I'll show you a picture. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is when it was being constructed. So this is a this is a photo from our front door angled to the right. Um, and this is a photo. I'm sorry, you said just one picture. Oh, I have I'm not gonna be. I but, just want to make sure that we understand where you live in relationship to the restaurant street yes. This is so there you go. so this is our house. Um where are we are. This is our house and our property, this green square. This orange square is Ambrosia Restaurant's current property. This red rectangle is where the property, the, the property they're seeking to get rezoned. So you can see this really affects one entire whole boundary of, of our home, which is why we feel so passionately about this decision. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah, given that our backyard also shares the, the backyard of that property and seeming that there are plans to actually use that backyard you know, our backyard is actually quite a nice space now, and we don't want the front and back of our property to be unusable. Okay. Um, I just want to mention that, uh, Jared, if you could just take some notes, we're, we'll have a, we can give you time to respond to these, but I, what I want to try to do is get through all of the um, neighbors' questions, uh -huh. questions and concerns. So uh, I'm not trying to not allow you to, to respond, but I just want you to stay until the very end since we have so many. Sure. Okay, we have someone who's showing up on the street screen as La Dame Phil. Yeah, Thank that's me. So Sorry, the name is um, Jill Weber and Thank I'm you. at um, 2319 Locust. Um, so I, I'd like to reiterate a lot of what Megan was saying. Um, of course, we never ever were asked by the lawyer and we're, we're almost directly across the street from Ambrosia. We were never ever given any kind of letter. We only got from Megan that uh, this meeting was scheduled, that there was a Zoom call and, and like her, we got the wrong Zoom address. So we were frantically typing around trying to find the correct one. Of course, I would like to point out that all of the Bonsall neighbors, 90% of whom also disagree, and would like this not to go forward, have the incorrect Zoom link. Uh, so they unfortunately will not be joining this meeting because we were all given 
the incorrect link. Um, one thing I'd really like to point out is that from the inception, I think the neighbors were all happy to try to allow this business to, to succeed during the pandemic. But when I say they have built no trust with the neighbors, that they have only destroyed it, um, that's an understatement. Uh, there has only been deceit and lies, whether through omission or directly. Um, fortunately, I own several restaurants in the city, so I am very aware of all the regulations surrounding streeteries. And the owners of Ambrosia informed Megan that they were required to allow seating in front of their home. And I pointed out that this was absolutely not true, um, but they were, they were simply lied to, lied, lied, literally lied to. And I went over with the, with the paperwork to the owners of Ambrosia, gave them the paperwork prior to their lying to Megan about this. So they were well aware of this. Um, We've, we've lodged many, many, many complaints with them about noise, about time of seating, time of closure, um, smoking, e everything, everything that, that, that we can think of. Um, sometimes they're civil, sometimes they're not, but things don't change. Um, and I, unfortunately, I have zero, zero trust that they will adhere to anything they say they're going to do or that they will comply with anything that, that is asked of them. Um, we are further impacted by deliveries, very, very, very strongly impacted by deliveries. Our garage, our house happens to be on the corner of Locust and Bonsall. And so it is the place for all trucks to park, especially because the streetery abuts so much into the road that no truck can, can park, no truck can park in front of Ambrosia to give deliveries. So all trucks park either in front of my home or the one adjoining. And so probably Six delivery trucks a day leave their, their engines idling, leave their coolers running. We've gotten in arguments. <laughs> um, it's not the delivery driver's fault, but Ambrosia makes no attempt, it seems, to, uh, to, to limit the deliveries, to limit the effect on the neighbors. Um, you know, I've been blocked out of my driveway. I've been blocked in my garage, out of my garage. Uh, we, can't, we can't open the windows because of, of the truck idling constantly. If they increase the size of this restaurant, my, my six delivery trucks a day, it's gonna be 12. And, you know, talk about, you know, Im impact on the neighborhood, let alone the lack of parking, let alone the fact that the owners reserve parking spaces for themselves while blocking off spaces for supposedly for tables, but that they then pull into and park in, they park in the, in the crosswalk, they put tables in the crosswalk, they put permanent planters abutting the crosswalk, all of these things that are illegal with the streeteries, they're supposed to have, I think it's eight feet between themselves and the intersection, they're, they abut it. They're not supposed to have more seats on the outside of the restaurant than they do inside, they do. So they have not abided by any regulations for two years. I, I, don't, I don't see that of giving them anything is gonna be helpful to anyone except them. And they don't seem to care about us or the neighborhood. So, um, that's that's my city. I better stop now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Jen, Jim, Madison, if, yeah. if I if I might dive in here because I think I might be able to streamline this for you. You only um, have four minutes. I know you only you only have four minutes. So. Right, but but I would I would stay. But I I it's clear that there are some concerns that the neighbors have that I wasn't fully aware of prior to this meeting. Uh, so I'm I'm going to suggest that it seems to make sense that we continue our zoning board hearing and uh, do a little bit more due, due diligence out reach to the near neighbors and perhaps come back to CCRA later in the fall um, after we have some answers to some of these specific questions. Because there, there are some topics here that are clearly uh, very important to the near neighbors um, that we need to do a little bit of, of further research on. And I, I don't want to take the committee's time if, okay. if it looks like we're going to have So what to we need to do before you leave is if everybody who has not spoken, can you mm -hmm. put your contact information in the chat so that Jared can take it with him. Please. And he, can, he can hear your objections uh, himself before. So we don't have, we wouldn't need to do it tonight because you will have another opportunity, but you can actually take it up with Jared directly. Yes, I, I would be happy to. Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys a, the, the time to do that. And by the way, are the folks that have their hands raised satisfied with that um, continuance and also resolution attempt to re resolve these differences. 
I see. As a committee thing. member, Janice, I would like to hear from Jared that he will personally ensure that whatever notice he gives as an RCO or to the community, that the Zoom, he double checks the information in terms of the Zoom link and anything else. Jared, we're gonna look at, look at that. Yes, absolutely. And we do have one uh, member who would like to, we're, we're, so we're gonna go ahead with that idea. I'm not trying to uh, muzzle anybody. So I see someone, W-E-L-T-Y-C, oh, who'd like yeah. to speak. Yeah. Claire Welty, W-E-L-T-Y. I'm at 2320 Locust Street. I've owned that residence for 33 years. And I also own 2318 Locust Street since 1995. And um, I concur with everything that Jill and Megan have said. I'm seem feeling very, very bad for what Megan has had to go through. The eateries are a problem. But um, what I'm most concerned about with this proposal is the fact that we're in a historic district. I don't like the idea of residents being converted to a restaurant, but moreover, the fact that the backyard would be filled with noise um, is completely unacceptable to me. I use my backyard as a sanctuary to do writing on the weekends, and I will not be able to sit in the back my backyard at 2320, 2318 Locust and write if there is noise coming from two yards over. It just will be impossible. Right now, you can't hear noise from the street in those backyards because they're so protected. And so I'd be very opposed to this because of potential noise from the backyards. Um, just to emphasize that in addition to everything else to concur with what Jill and um, Megan have said. Thank, Thank you. you for that. And have you put your contact information into the chat so that Jared can take this up with you directly? Um, I put my address in, but I'll put my email address and my cell phone number in as well. Thank you. Okay. Jared, if you have to leave the meeting, I'll be watching the chat and I will provide any uh, additional contact information that is provided to us to you directly. Sure. Thank you. I'll stay on for another minute or two in case anybody else puts their info in the chat. And uh, I appreciate everyone's time and, and for taking me out of out of order, even though it took a little longer than we anticipated. So th hope, thank, thank you, Mr. Clinton. Mr. Clinton, uh, we're ready for 2118 Pine Street. All right, thank you. I'll share my screen. Is that visible? Yes, it is. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Henry Clinton. I represent the owners of 2118 Pine Street, uh, Lynn Ann Schwartz and Leslie Sershock, both of whom are on the call, as well as uh, Sean Farrell is on the call. He's gonna give any architectural perspective that one would need. Uh, as was stated at the beginning, our zoning hearing is next week, it's August 3rd. Uh, this is my table of contents and I'll walk through these uh, documents quickly because I know you have a long agenda. Uh, this is the deed indicating ownership. My clients have owned the property uh, which is the intersection of Van Pelt and Pine since 2007. Uh, the ref this is my notification to all the neighbors. This is my certification of mailing indicating that I mailed out 104 pieces of uh, mail to the following addresses within 250 feet of the property as required by the planning commission. We also have uh, in response to one of the other questions, the earlier presentation, do we have a neighborhood support and are the neighbors aware? Uh, these are the petition has been signed by numerous neighbors on both Pine Street as well as Van Pelt, indicating their non-opposition uh, to this request. Uh, this is my application for appeal, but here's the key document. Basically, uh, we are seeking to restore and replace an existing rooftop deck, which has been in existence since before my clients purchased the property. Uh, when uh, Lynn Ann and Leslie decided to restore the deck and rebuild the, the decking. Uh, they naturally uh, went to a reputable contractor and design firm, Bellwether, and they naturally applied for a permit. When they applied for a permit, they discovered that is Bellwether, weather, that the rooftop deck had never been properly permitted. So Bellwether went through the process of submitting for the rooftop deck as if it weren't there, although it's been there since, as I said, prior to 2007. And a refusal came back saying that the roof deck on the Van Pelt side only needs to be set back five feet, when in reality, it's only set back two feet, nine inches. So I wanted to show you photographs. This is Leslie uh, and Lene's home at the corner, as I say, of Van Pelt and Pine Street. Uh, this is an aerial view, again, showing you this is the property looking toward the south. 
And this is the, the corner property again, looking toward the west. Some close up photographs to show you the rooftop deck with the beautiful wrought iron railing, uh, mansard roof. They also have a garage in the rear. Again, some more perspectives. And the reason uh, on the refusal uh, that indicates the deck is only set back two feet, nine inches is because when you take a straight line from where the, uh, the brick structure is, and since the mansard kind of curves back, by the time you would take that straight line to the top of where the rooftop deck is, the deck is actually set back almost three feet. Some more perspective photographs. These are some photographs from the rooftop deck itself. Some amazing and beautiful views. You can see uh, some of the, the decking is worn and there's actually, when I get to the, uh, the site plan, you can see that, the, that there was at one time uh, a usable hot tub, which is going to be removed and not, not be used anymore. So this is the bellwether design. This is the existing rooftop deck. And to the right is the proposed. You can see there's an opening there for a hot tub, which is going to be removed. There's also some large planters, uh, which are built into the deck, which will be removed. The access to the deck is through the rear area of the property. There's a set of uh, metal steps that lead up to the rooftop deck. Um, and it, it's in dire need of repair. And that's why we're here tonight. Uh, again, the rooftop deck is set back almost three feet. Uh, the code requires five feet, but since it's a pre-existing condition that was not really put in place by my clients, we're asking that the, uh, the community, which is in support, as well as the, the committee look kindly upon this application. And with that, I would, uh, would rest and open the questions and, and answer period to the, the committee as well as to the neighborhood. You're muted. We did have some background noise, sorry. Okay, uh, I'm looking at our committee members and seeing that Doug Mellor has a question. Hello, um, I live half a block away. I never got any notice. I live on Pine Street, never got any notice. And when I wanted to get a deck, I went to the historical and they said it had to be at least five feet back. And um, that was rejected. So I don't know why I would permit this. Well, I, this deck has been in existence since 2007. And I'm, I'm looking at the, the notices here. These are all the properties that I mailed. Do you see 2010 Pine? Let me blow this up and we'll look. There's 2115, 2119. I'd like to stipulate you did not receive a notice, Doug. No, I did not receive a notice. And as I say, when I went to try to do this, I would- We understand rejected. your objection. Here, here's 2110 Pine right here. No, 2010. Oh. Well, so you're I'm half a block. Away. I'm half a block away. Right, you're 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 too far away from the project according to the 250 foot rule that we're obligated to, to follow, and you know I'm, I'm sorry that you weren't able to get a deck, but um, certainly uh, yeah. that's you know. All right, I'd like to go to Ben, please. Wine Rob or Z? Ben Ben W. It's you. Oh, that's me. Sorry. Um, Question is, has this been run through historic? And second question, if we're proposing removing planters, although it is a very green property from where I see, or do, there, are we doing anything to make up for the removal of the planters? Yeah, it's my understanding that my clients will be replacing planters, but they won't be built in. They will be actually resting on the deck. And as far as historical, we, we were, you know, we went to L and I. L and I would looked at the situation, and uh, we would not get any notice that we had to go through any historical uh, settings. You would not necessarily yeah. receive you, you notice of that right? during zoning. Excuse me, I don't uh, know who's speaking. Uh, Ryan, can you put yourself on mute, please? Uh, I'll do one of them. I'll mute you myself. Two dollars. Two dollars. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from the committee? 
Yeah. Uh, would the new railing would it obstruct light? In no, no. I said the committee. Excuse me, Andre. Uh, you'll you'll get a chance in a minute. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the zoning committee? All right, Andre. Sorry to cut you off. Go ahead, Andre Geffen. Yeah. Um, would the existing rail would, would the ex existing railing have pa allow more light to pass through than the new railing? Uh, the, the existing railing is going to remain. Okay. Thank you. Any other members of the of the public? Okay, seeing none, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Clinton, for your presentation, and we will take it all into consideration. Do you want to hear from any members of the community? I just did. I was asking, I, I just opened it to the community. I'm sorry if you didn't hear that, Ben. Uh, there are people here uh, from okay, the community. I, just, I see them now. Okay, we have three. We have Joe Wilkinson, and don't worry, worry Earl, Earl and Molly, we will get to you. Hey, I'm uh, at 2120 Pine Street, which you can see in the picture directly to the right of Linnea and Leslie's property. And I just want to um, say that I, I did get the Zoom link and it worked fine. And I want to pledge my support for this work. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, Mr. Marsh. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, this is Earl Marsh. I'm at 2130 Pine. Uh, I just want to comment that. Uh, the owners of 2118 maintain the lushest, greenest sidewalk in the city. I mean, they, they, they really uh, make an effort to contribute to um, the neighborhood in this way. Um, I don't see any negative impact of the existing deck setback on the neighborhood. I think it would be onerous to make them comply with a five-foot setback. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. Can we go Dennis, to Molly? Patty, you don't have your hand up, but certainly you can. Yes. Just let me go. Uh, Wait a minute. I'm, I'm calling on people in order. And don't worry, Patty, I see you. I'll get back to you just a minute. <laughs> All right. Um, the next one I had on my list was Molly. Hi, this is Molly. I'm going to let my husband speak. Uh, so we live uh, just around the corner from, 20, uh, from Leslie and Lene, 408 South Van Pelt. Uh, I'll echo everything that has previously been said about them being great neighbors and having the greenest uh, house in Philadelphia that I've seen. And uh, we already, um, so first of all, we can barely notice the rooftop because you have to crane your neck quite a lot to see it. And uh, uh, because there's not going to be any meaningful change uh, from our perspective, there's no reason to deny this. So we're, we're strongly in support. Thank you, Fat. All right. Patty, the go girl. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi. I have lived at 412 South Van Pelt Street all my life. I was born there and I live in 410 South Van Pelt Street. So I've been here for 68 years. I remember what that house once was many, many moons ago. And I fully support Leslie and Linnea's plans to make the, the roof deck safer and better and and i see no reason why it shouldn't be approved they take a great great care of the neighborhood thank you patty we have one more barbie thanks can you hear me yes we can uh, yes i live at 2113 pine street i'm across the street from leslie and lene at a slight diagonal. And I, I would say that of everybody who's spoken, I probably have the clearest view of their roof and I see nothing. Um, and so I want to add my support. I think that they're extraordinarily conscientious members of the community. Um, they are very green conscious and they are very neighbor friendly. And I see no reason to, to push back on this. Thank you, Barbie. Seeing that there are no other comments from the community and speak up now if I'm mistaken. Okay, I want to thank the applicants presentation. Oh, there are two more. Why don't though the hands can the hands were already, they were up, they haven't been removed. So I think we have completed the public portion of this presentation. And I want to thank you all.
and we will be back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Clinton. Next project is 405 okay. South 24th Street, ZBA number MI 2022-003848, hearing date November 9th, 2022 at 2 p.m. The application is for visitor accommodations to an existing structure. Who is here representing that project? Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Brandon Saverin. Um, I am Heather DeGrand's lawyer. Heather is here with me um, for uh, just to get things started. So this is actually 405 South 17th Street um, below oh, Pond of Wade. My apologies. I, I, had, I printed out the un incorrect agenda. It was a typo. We had fixed it. Okay. So, yeah, sorry. No problem. Thank you. Um, so um, may I share my screen to get yes, started? Please. Okay. Um, could I just ask a question? The correct address is what? It's uh, 405 South 17th Street, Mr. Ah, Martin. Okay. He never makes a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, good evening. Um, again, my name is Brandon. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Heather, um, who owns the subject uh, property in a moment. Um, just not that everybody on this call doesn't already know this block, but um, we're talking about 405 South 17th, which is a historic trinity um, on uh, 17th between Waverly and Pine on the east side. Um, it's uh, shown here on Google Street View, has this nice uh, mural on the side of it. Sort of an interesting little half block, um, has three very similar uh, trinities, um, 401, 03, 05, right next to one another. Um, you can see how shallow they are, which contributes to the uh, diminutive size of the, each home. This is a um, uh, non-accessory parking lot, which is owned uh, by somebody else, none of those three homes. Um, and then across the street here, I believe is 1700 Pine Street, which is a eight unit apartment building to the best of my knowledge, takes up the entire uh, half block on the other side there. Um, and here's our zoning refusal. So we are here um, for permission to use the home for visitor accommodation. Um, what does that mean, at least as, as far as we intend it, intend it to, to be used? We want to use it as um, an Airbnb rental property. And um, you'll see in this little photo, that's Heather, who is um, the new owner of this home. On the refusal, you'll see Karen Brees here, um, who sold the property to Heather uh, in the winter. Karen was already using it uh, for this purpose. And because of that, um, when Heather purchased the property, there were already bookings that she had to take over. Um, we're here tonight to hopefully get permission from CCRA and then the zoning board um, to continue this use. Um, we have Heather specifically, not me, to give credit where credit is due, um, went around uh, door knocking uh, in addition to the mandatory mailing in the 250 foot radius, um, obtained 16 letters of support here is one of them as a sample, so you can read the text of the letter. They're all the same. Um, these two letters include the adjacent neighbors at 401 and 405. Uh, here's the, uh, sorry, 40, 403 and 401. I apologize. Here's the 403 letter as another example. So uh, we have some photos of the interior of the home. I thought this was a good moment uh, for me to pause and allow Heather to um, introduce herself, um, tell you about uh, what she does for a living here in Philadelphia, how she's handled this property since she bought it and took over those existing bookings. And then Heather, maybe you can narrate as I flip through the photos. So um, can, you, can you say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, um, my name is Heather DeGrands and uh, I've lived in Philly for about 15 years. Um, I'm the owner and operator of Knockbox Cafe, which is over in the University City area on uh, 45th Street between Pine and Osage. So I'm a service and hospitality industry kind of person. Um, I live here with 
with my husband and my two teenagers. Um, and I have a daughter who attends Penn. And um, so we bought this property from one of my really good friends who had owned it for six years and run it as an Airbnb. And um, she moved out to Bucks County. So it was just not very feasible for her to be so far away. And I've always been totally in love with this cute little historic gem. So I was, you know, happy to take it off her hands. And then um, shortly they sort of thereafter changed some of the um, permit requirements. And so I just wanted to go through this uh, properly. And I took over some of her reservations in the meantime. But um, just to sort of get started, what you're looking at is the front view of the house that um, Brandon has shown there. If you want to scroll through. Um, the whole property is very small. It's in a total of 675 square feet. So it is like the original tiny house. Um, I believe it dates back to approximately 1800. Um, and um, we've tried really hard to preserve some of its charm. It does have some uh, okay. tiny up upgrades that have gone on, but the kitchen is incredibly small. Uh, it has also Excuse me, I, is there a question? What a metal. <laughs> Can you, Heather, it's, uh, I think some background noise we're catching. Oh, okay. Just keep um, that. So the kitchen's very small uh, because the house is so small. It's, it's more of a um, sort of a boutique kitchen. It doesn't have an oven. It's got just a two burners, uh, gas stove top and a mini fridge and like convection microwave. Um, and this is the front room when you first walk in where there's a tiny little dining table. And then as you scroll down, there's the standard tiny spiral staircases that um, most of these trinities have. Um, and this is the second floor. Uh, and then the back where you see that big wooden door is the one bathroom. And that's another view of the second floor facing the front. And a picture or two of the one bathroom. And then the top floor is a bedroom. Basically, that's it. What you see is what you get. Um, you can really only fit a bed in there. <laughs> and um, so it's kind of a nice, uh, perfect situation for somebody visiting Philadelphia. Um, it's, it's got its cute historical charm uh, and tiny, uh, feasible enough amenities for shorter stays. Heather, let me just close with like a, a quick sort of um, internal Q&A before I hand it back to the committee. So when you purchased on this, uh, closed on this uh, property, uh, mm -hmm. you immediately applied for a zoning permit and it sounds like hired me shortly thereafter. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. When I went down to try to get all the proper, I had already gotten the um, <clears throat> commercial activity uh, license and I went to go try to get all the proper licenses and permits for doing this. And the gentleman who was helping me at Ellen, I basically told me, well, this literally changed like a few days ago. Um, so automatically you're probably going to get rejected. So there's, this is what you need to do. And he kind of just walked me through the steps, but I decided to reach out to Brandon and his law firm um, because I wanted a little bit of guidance since it was such a new change to how to get these um, permits. Um, is it true that you do uh, not allow more than two guests in the unit and that you have a written statement in the listing discouraging children because of the steps, children and pets? Yes, um, we have, uh, a, because there's only, because it's so small and there's only one queen size bed, uh, I do limit it to only two guests at a time. And I strictly say that um, children and pets uh, are not something that is allowed because of the precarious staircase and um, just this limited size. And I also have a two night minimum stay. Um, do you, uh, you've told me in the past, you actually go down and meet your guests in person when yes. you can, is that right? Yeah, this is true. Um, I'm very attentive to my guests. I try to interact with each and every one of them. Um, I think it's also part of the reason why I was so quickly promoted to a super host because um, I want to make sure that I can provide guidance just both with the house and to the city of Philadelphia, which I really love. And last question for you. Um, when um, you um, 
Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Actually, two more. It's on the historic register. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. For Philadelphia. Um, okay. And um, you, uh, am I, was I correct when I said that you went and collected those letters personally? Yes. Yeah. My husband, um, Joseph, who's also on this call, um, he and I went around and uh, I had already kind of engaged with meeting some of the neighbors anyway, because I'm there so often. So um, it, for, for a good first couple of them, it wasn't so hard because I had already kind of met the two people who live on the end of my unit. And then also, you know, at 401 and 403, and then a couple of the businesses and a couple other neighbors as well. So yes, I did walk and around and make sure to engage. Very, very last one. You currently have someone in there that's sort of like a more medium term tenant. And can you tell us how long that person's been living there right now? Um, so she's there for a total of two months. Um, and she was a person who I sort of inherited from Karen, the former owner who had reserved it a long, long time ago because she is part of a master's program at PAFA. So yes, so she's uh, an at atypical stay, but yes. Okay, so um, that's it. And I, I, sorry for taking so much time there. I wanted to arm the committee with basically as much information as we possibly could just to get this started. And you know, we were certainly open to your questions. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Heather and Joel. I really appreciate the completeness of your presentation and the questions actually will help us because you answered a lot of questions that may have come up. Having said that, I'd like to know if there are questions from our committee. I'm looking at you all. Janice, okay. I have one. Oh, wait. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. And then Quick Ben, question you. Brandon, Brandon um, if I understood the presentation correctly, the prior owner had been operating this as the Airbnb and Heather's taking over the listings and that the law, the ordinance changed recently. Why have you not filed as a non-conforming use? So that's a, that's a great question, Bob. Um, you know, I think that the, um, let, let, let me go part A, part B. Part A, yes. Um, Karen, to the best of our knowledge, was operating it this way for uh, five or six years. Yes. Um, in terms of why we didn't pursue non-conforming status. So um, it's two, two reasons. I have, as a lawyer, taken um, what are called appeals against L&I in order to get that official designation as a non-conforming use. Um, it's, it's very burdensome. It involves drafting a formal legal brief. And when you go to the ZBA for that purpose, the law department typically sends a lawyer in opposition to your application, which they don't do if you apply for a variance. So I thought the first thing we should try was getting your support um, as CCRA and then seeing if we could get a variance so as not to turn this into a confrontation with the city's law department. Um, the other point is that I'm pretty sure what the city would say is that the text of the code itself hasn't changed, but the enforcement has changed. So, you know, uh, let's say that this sort of uh, picked up steam and popularity after the Pope came in 2015. That may very well be when Karen started doing this. Um, it was only until really recently that Elle and I took an interest in making sure that these were licensed in sort of a perverse way they really cracked down more on longer term rentals through the rental license program than this kind you, of- You've answered my question. I understand. Okay. Uh, sorry. Appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon and Bob. That was an excellent question. And I'm looking at Rick, who is on our committee, I believe. Can you please tell us what your question is? Okay. Hey, um... I am on the committee. Um, I know. I, know. I, had a, I had a question. I had a question for Brandon mainly, but um, also for for us to bring up if if the applicant can't answer it is: Do we know anything about the policy discussions that led to the change of enforcement? Is this part of uh, a city cracking down on um, Airbnbs as as a tactic for uh, combating? Um, gentrification, you know, freeing up rental housing for <clears throat> lower income people in, in um, middle and upper class neighborhoods. Um, is there something behind it that 
we should be weighing when we weigh the clear justice of having you know, this tiny property um, in the marketplace and, and able to be maintained and be beautiful as it is um, against whatever else the city has in mind. Um, Rick, I would, I'm curious if any of your colleagues have, you know, as a lawyer, I don't think I'm particularly predisposed to answer the policy question more than any of the folks on the committee might be. Um, but um, did, should I go ahead nonetheless? I just wanted to give other folks a chance to chime in there. Brandon, you should go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I think that you raised some really valid points, Rick. I mean, I, I, not knowing with certainty why that change happened off the top of my head, yes, um, limiting the number of Airbnbs frees up uh, and alleviates pressure on the more traditional rental market. Um, the hotel lobby is very strong in Philadelphia, and I would imagine, particularly during the dip in international travel that happened because of COVID, that they thought that uh, limiting these units would uh, basically direct demand to traditional hotels. So there's two possible reasons. I think what I'd say with regard to this unit is simply that this is a place that a vigorous young person or two would probably live in. So um, at least we're not taking away a family's uh, sort of full-sized home here. And it's been very well maintained under Karen's stewardship and Heather will do the same. And if you were to visit you know, her store in West Philadelphia or her home in Garden Court, um, I, I think you'd sort of trust her um, capabilities as well. Thank you, Brandon. We have a question from the committee, Ben. Actually more of a comment on w. the last question. Yeah, I'm not Oh, sorry, uh, no, Ben W. Are you okay, Ben Z? You're up next if you wanna be. Go ahead, Ben W. Just more of a comment. Again, the city really didn't change their enforcement, but they got Airbnb to enforce it for them. So originally the deadline, I think was this month that uh, it was gonna go into effect. And then I think they pushed it a little bit because they realized um, how much effort it would take to get a lot of theirs um, legalized this way. But basically by the end of the year, if not before, if you don't have this, then Airbnb won't, will pull the listings. Thanks for the clarification, Ben. Are there any other questions from the committee? Ben Z. Yeah, I'm not even sure that we can get into this, but uh, would you be adverse to uh, an approval with a proviso that you would be limited to two guests uh, at a time and no children and pets? Um, we would not be opposed to that, Ben. And I yeah. love your background with the Dorchester because I lived there for five years. Actually, two doors away from there, but it's my yeah. turn. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, that, that'd be no problem. That'd be no problem. And when you say children, what ages are you saying not below? Um, Heather, maybe you can answer that. Does I mean, on the listing, I, I, I sort of generically specify small children or toddlers. Like, I, I think you have to be of a very uh, able <laughs> walking body to go up those stairs. They're so tiny that even when you go up and down them, you sort of even on the way down have to kind of angle your foot in a just right way to, to stand on it. So um, it's difficult to carry things up and down them. So um, I, you know, I would say probably I could specify that. I have personally not had any children stay there um, at all. Uh, under 12, I think there was one person who brought their uh, 12 or 13 year old daughter with them. But um, when I said on the listing was small children and I, I could be more clarifying in that and say, you know, of preschool and below age or something, I really don't have a problem with that because for me, it's just like a safety thing. And uh, typically uh, I think that's yeah. the nature of the person who yeah. wants to- I'm not even it. sure we need or want to go there. I was just curious. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Okay, I'm assuming that no other committee members have questions. Okay, Charles Robin, at the last minute. Just, just as a, a rule, or you cannot discriminate against race, creed, color, sex, national origin, or, or others. So uh, I don't know if CCR would want to say uh, no children, certainly because of the size, 675 square feet. I guess there is a coda on my desk somewhere here. 
uh, limiting two guests and two night stays. But uh, I would stay away from CCRA saying uh, discriminating against children. Are there any other comments from the, thank you, Charles. Uh, we don't see any, and I'm gonna I go to three hands. I know oh, Wade, Wade is still on. Wade Albert, would you please tell me what your, is on your mind? Sure, so, um, so my name is Wade Albert and I'm counsel for CCRA. Um, we could talk about this more in closed session, but I, I wanna second what Charles Robbins said, um, that uh, that's an issue that we should certainly consider that it would be, potentially a problem on our end uh, by limiting uh, who's allowed to stay. But we can talk about more of that in closed session. Thank you. All right. Um, I have two members of the public that I see, Andre Giffen, Kathy Clark. Let's take Andre first. If there's anyone else, please bring it to my attention. Andre? Yeah, would this... Would so you said that this property would otherwise if it were not be used for Airbnb, it would be used for um, more long-term residents? Well, Andre, you know, um, I think that's fair to say because it's historically protected and um, Heather loves it. So she has no interest in modifying it physically. So that would seem to be, you know, the only natural use for it. And since it's just slightly under the average size for a one bedroom in Philadelphia, like would it, would it be fair to say that it would be an affordable unit if it were not used for Airbnb? Um, you know, I, I can't, I'm not a broker. I'm really not in that line of business, truly. Um, I think that the size would be weighed against the location, which is phenomenal. And um, there's probably some value in its, um, the charm of its historic features. So I'm sure it's not going to come out to be the most affordable unit in Philadelphia, but sure, you're right. It is basically a one bedroom in terms of size. So, you know, um, seems like it would land somewhere moderately. Um, I don't know if I can kind of offer more than that. It hasn't been, I'll say it hasn't been rented as a regular rental in, in over five years. So we also don't really have any good, like hard data to go off of. Well, according to Karen, um, who my friend who I bought the house from, when she bought the house, the previous owners prior to her were renting it as an Airbnb for two years as well. So in total, it's been there as an Airbnb for over eight year, eight and a half years. Any of the other houses in the Trinity rented out as regular units? <clears throat> um, do you mean the adjacent um, two? Yes. To my knowledge, they both are. I don't see, um, I'm like looking in live time here, but I don't see any licenses or permits on those properties that would indicate that they are used for anything other than regular rental, meaning like over 30 days at a time, at least. So all three are unlicensed short-term rentals. Uh, no, I, I'm not saying that at all. I have no idea what is going on for the other two beyond what's publicly available and permitting. And I certainly don't want to like infer that they are operating illegally. I, I don't personally know those folks and that'd be very unfair of me to. And I do think that is an irrelevant uh, point to this case. Yeah, we could move on. I, I have one other person, Kathy Clark. Hi, um, my husband and I are here. We live right around the corner on Waverly. And um, we actually do have um, a concern about having a transient population um, coming in and out of the home. And we've noticed even on our block kind of a degradation of the block from renters um, just in general, leaving trash out when it's not trash day um, and other issues associated with renters that might even be exacerbated more by shorter term renters. Because that's one of the biggest signs in the neighborhood is when they stay for a few days and leave, they leave their trash outside when it's not trash day. And then animals and what not come and uh, yeah. tear it up and you have trash in the street. We have any response from the applicant? Um, well, I can say that um, 
I, I have a cleaning team that comes and I pull the trash after every time that they come myself. Uh, you can often see me rolling up in my car and grabbing the trash and taking it myself. So the person who's staying there now, who is there for almost two months, she's putting it out on the regular trash day. But when the shorter term people are there, I'm the person taking the trash away. So it almost never even gets put out on the street by my uh, guests. All right. Are there any other comments from the public? With that, I'd like want to thank Joel, Heather, and Brandon for a complete presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll be back to you. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to the next case. It's 334 South 24th Street. The application is for a proposed building, building a two one-story additions to an existing row house. The ZBA number is MI 2022-00, hearing date 11-20. 22, he, who is here representing that application? I am David Orfanides. <clears throat> hey, David, take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. David Orfanides with Orfanides and Turner. Uh, I'm here this evening on behalf of uh, Zach Shapiro and Devin Malley, Malley uh, who are the owners of the property. Uh, they presently uh, live in Baltimore, but they have family here in Philadelphia, and they're going to be moving into this property um, with their um, children. Um, the property is located um, right across or caddy corner from the northwest corner of Fittler Square. You can see right here, oh, let me do a screen save or screen share, excuse me one second. Yeah. So you can see right here, Fittler Square, we're caddy cornered on the, to the Northwest on the corner of uh, 24th Street and Panama Street. Here are some aerial images um, of the property uh, that you can see right here to the right. Some additional area aerial images pulling back. Again, you can see here's Fittler Square, um, newer construction off the Southwest corner. And again, our property located right here on the corner. You'll see from additional photos that located directly to the west of us is 2403 Panama Street, uh, fronts on Panama. Um, we back up to the sidewall of that building. And then to the north of us is 332 uh, South 24th Street. Across the street from us is 336 uh, South 24th. Um, the property is zoned RSA 5. Uh, for, which calls for use of single family as a single family dwelling. Um, the proposed proposal is to utilize the property as a single family dwelling. Um, my clients plan to use it as their home for their family. Here's some additional photographs of the property. <clears throat> the first two you can, you, for most of us we know, are taken from Fittler Square. Um, here's a view to here. Uh, the second from the right is from 24th Street, and then from a little further uh, to the north on 24th Street, you can see abutting us is 332, and then 330 um, South 24th Street. Uh, we do have letters of support from both of these owners, the owners of both of these properties, um, and um, I can show those to you. Um, going back to the aerial images, uh, we attempted to get uh, a letters of support, a letter of support from the property located across us on the opposite corner, on the southwest corner of Panama and South 24th. It appears that, that property is up for sale, or soon will be up for sale. When uh, we we um, went to the property, it looked like it was being staged for sale. And then uh, we are in discussions. We afford a copy of the support letter, position letter. I mean, to 20, the owners of 2403 and. My clients and their architects have been in discussions with, with them. We do not have a letter, position letter from them as of yet. Um, here on the left is another photograph from the corner of our property. Um, the second in from the left is to the west on Panama Street. And then uh, I think this is helpful, the picture all the way to the right. You can see our structure is has a shorter portion that runs along, and you'll see it in the zoning drawings, along Panama Street, a longer leg that extends uh, a little deeper 
uh, to the north portion, and that lines up with the property um, to the north of us, the abutting property to the north of us. You can see there's an existing fence wall with a gate in it. There's a fence wall um, on the north side of our rear yard and um, between us and 330, uh, 332 South 24th Street. And you can see that wall right here. Prior owners built this uh, roof structure, coverage structure uh, at some point. Um, that's still there. That will be removed. That's the area actually for one of the one one of the two one-story additions that we're proposing. Um, you can see here there's this little glass uh, bump out that's going to be removed, and in its place um, there's going to be a larger um, one-story glass roofed structure and you'll see that in a little bit and here from the backyard is the view of that fence wall and gate that runs along Panama Street. Uh, I have some additional photographs I could go back and use uh, at some point down the road um, as we go just some additional pictures. Uh, originally my clients you know to kind of update and make the property a little more suitable for their uses they had they were looking at in a bumping up the roof on this property. Um, they've now scaled back on what they're looking to do. And again, just two small one-story additions in the uh, in the small rear yard. And again, here's another view, a little better view of the rear of the building. Um, you'll see that the one addition where the existing glass structure is down here is gonna be at about the same height and angle down. And then you can see the balconies. These are not our balconies. They're the balconies on the 330, the rear of 332, South 24th, our neighbor. And again, some other views from down Panama Street as you walk down Panama Street, how you can see less and less, uh, obviously, of the rear yard area where the additions are going to be proposed as you move. Here I'm moving back towards the property, but as you move away, you can see from the different addresses how the visibility is going to be less and less. Uh, here a copy of the zoning drawings that we filed with um, the city of Philadelphia. Uh, these ones are the ones that are stamped off by the streets department. Uh, we did have to go to streets because we are um, looking to utilize the seller uh, for living space. And as such, we had, we're proposing an egress well out in the footway. Um, question right now is exactly where that's going to be located. The architects can speak about that originally. It was going to be over here in the corner. Um, and um, there's some utility lines out there. So there's a possibility of that possibly moving to a different location uh, around the property. But you can see right now, uh, it's slightly, it's a really weirdly shaped property. Um, but it's normal for most of it. It's a rectangle. Then it has this tail that kind of bumps out um, that's actually presently being used by 332 South 24th. That's on the opposite side of the fence wall that I mentioned that divides the rear yards or the rear areas of the property, the rears of the property. Um, the lot is only, it's very small. It's uh, 711.6 square feet. So we have a, an odd shaped parcel. Um, part of the parcel we aren't even able, we aren't presently accessing. And on top of that, it's, it's very small. Uh, presently, the distance from that longer leg that I mentioned right here of the three-story building is 4.8 feet away from the rear property line. So that's a pre-existing non-conforming rear yard depth because that the required rear yard depth in RSA 5 is 9 feet. The present open area or occupied area exceeds um, the occupied area exceeds the minimum area doesn't isn't met. Um, we're looking at 85% occupied area, which is only 15% open area. And you'll see here that with what I'm going to show you in a minute, we're dropping that open area a little bit more, uh, about cutting it in half. And then um, you'll see this area right here where there's this uh, about eight foot, eight to nine foot fence wall. We're going to be building a, a, an addition for a powder room back here. And as such, because this portion of the addition is going to be right up against the rear property line, our rear depth is going to be zero. Um, and that is uh, one of our, that's a, our refusal that you'll see in our notice of refusal. Um, I'm going to switch to these enlarged views um, for our site plan. Uh, it's a little bit easier to look at than the zoning drawings that were uh, submitted to LNI. And so here you have the existing again. These areas are, you know, this area is what's going to be removed. There's a planner, then that glass, that glass bump out, and then the uh, 
that odd kind of covering shed roof um, are going to be removed. And then basically in there, in the place of the shed roof is the one story addition here, and then a slightly larger one story addition here. So this is this addition, uh, which you'll see in the floor plan is uh, nine feet, seven inches by eight feet, one and a half inches, not a lot. And then the smaller one that's uh, to the rear of the, um, the longer portion is uh, five feet by seven feet, five inches. So two small additions that leave a proposed open area back in this area here. Here you can see what you see is existing. This is the glass bump out. This is the existing masonry wall with the gate in it. And then this is the uh, that covering shed cover that you see um, that we've shown you pictures of. And then here's a view kind of looking from the West, what it would look like as it presently exists. And this is what we're looking to propose. So what you have is this is the, the, um, the bump out uh, to the rear. And that's, like I said, going to be a powder room. It's about the same height as the existing fence wall. And then you have this, uh, this structure right here. This is all you'll see in the renderings, is it, even though it extends above the fence wall, is all going to be glass. Here's our refusals. Um, and again, they have to do with um, the open area and the occupied area. I mean, open area versus occupied area that I mentioned and the rear yard depth that I also mentioned. A uh, copy of our appeal to the zoning board and here are the floor plans. So um, this is basically what we're, we're looking at here. Um, this is the area of the addition. One addition. I think we quite had a room in a dining room and entry. David, mm -hmm. I just would like to let you know that we do understand the proposal. Okay. I would like you just to spend the last maybe sure. 30, 45 seconds telling us sure. about what you believe the impacts are so that we can sure. get through the project. Thank you. No worries. So just real quickly, here's the glass roof. You can see kind of modern, a nice take on what the you know store qualities without disturbing them. And um, we did do a shadow study. Uh, well, here are renderings, additional renderings, but we did do a shadow study, and basically the shadow study shows that there's there's no impact because we are up against the wall, the, the um, side wall of the building to the west of us, and because of the depth of the building to the north of us and the height of the additions, um, that there's, there's no effect uh, in terms of shadowing upon the neighboring properties. And... Uh, a 14303 notice that went out. Oops, that's a uh, zoning archive. But we did send out the 14303 notice as required by the um, by the zoning code to the list of addresses that were provided by um, the from the planning commission link. We will stipulate your packages complete. Thank you. There you go. And with that, uh, I I open the floor to any questions and uh, the comments and discussion. Thank you, David. Okay, let's look at our committee and see if there are hands up. I see Ben W. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Just a quick question. I believe you're still in the Rittenhouse Fittler Historic. Have you done any preview with Historic with regards to the obviously proposed glass structure? Number two, um, greening. We're taking away some open space. Any consideration to our list of trees, permeable permeable pavers, green wall, et cetera, to try to make up for some of that loss of open space? Um, I mean, so uh, I can let the architects talk about historic commission, but we, they're very familiar with this project, first with what was originally gonna, we were looking to do, and then with the present design, and I can have trade architecture speak to that. In terms of the, um, in terms of the greening, it is a, it's bricked in the back right now, and there is, it's an idea of uh, having gravel in that open area with it being properly drained um, uh, with what is being proposed. As you know, the Panama Street sidewalk is pretty narrow. So getting um, some trees there is kind of limited. And um, and then so there's not a lot of frontage on uh, South 24th Street. But uh, Catherine, I think you're you're handling the call for trade. Can you real quickly talk about your interaction with the Historic Commission about what we're presently proposing and what's in front of CCRA right now? Yes, I can confirm that they've seen everything that we've presented here and that they're um, they've approved it. So that's it. That's at the staff level, correct? 
At the staff level, that is correct. Yes. And they'll handle this at the staff level, correct? They have confirmed that they feel confident that this could be handled at the staff level. Yes. And just real quickly, could you introduce yourself to everybody? Yes, Catherine Trevendall from Trade Architects. Yes. Thank you. Just for the committee, I uh, just we want you all to know that the Stork Commission uh, does not necessarily have to approve zoning. They only get involved when there's the building permit details. Right. So the fact that you've reached out to the Historic Commission is is complimented. Thank you. Yeah, we yeah, you don't want to go through a variance and then find out you can't do it. So my recommendation <laughs> is to get with the historic first and then figure out what they'll let you do and then take that to the zoning board or preferably do it by right. But um yeah, that's how we did it here. And yes, they're very there's been a lot of communication back and forth um between my clients and trade and the historic commission. So mm -hmm. all right, seeing no other questions from our committee. I, I will now move on to the public comment period. I said just one. Did I understand, David, that you Charles, said you're two, he didn't you're have two your hands raised? I'm, I'm sorry. Your two adjacent neighbors have letters of support. Is that correct? So the two, well, the one is adjacent 332, um, Judy Wicks, and then um, uh, Inga and Ken to the next property up. And I can show you those letters of uh, support real quickly. Um, here is, let's see. Here's Judy Wicks, uh, 332. And then here's Inga, uh, Saffron, and Ken Kalfas. So they're the two properties to the north of us. Um, the property, across, like I said, that's across the street on the southwest corner. Um, there wasn't anybody home. And then I think, and Catherine can speak to this. She was just out there the other day. Catherine, uh, rather than putting words in your mouth, I think you talked to a real estate agent. Yes, we've been trying to get a hold of the neighbors across the street, but they hadn't responded to anything. So we went over the other day to knock on doors and um, the agents were there um, staging the house. So we left another letter to try and get in touch with them, but have not heard from them. And then you have been in, uh, I guess, in pretty extensive communications with the owners of 2403 Panama, correct? Yes, we have met and spoke to them and I believe they are present. Okay, so, all right, Charles. That was are there any the, other the, questions the, from our committee for the court reporter that was in nodding his head okay. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, are there any other folks from the committee no seeing none okay are there comments from the public i see dana hens please please unmute thank you hi um I, uh, I live in 2403 Panama. I've been here for 20 years. And um, I guess in the last two years or so, since the property has been vacant, we've had a whole huge issue with water pouring into our basement from that courtyard. So I have a lot of concerns. I'm sorry, there's a little feedback. My husband's upstairs too. Is it all right? Um, so I've been trying to talk, I, uh, we've been looking at drawings and I'm still, I had a couple of questions in the last email that were not answered. So um, I'd like an answer before I gave any support or non-support. Um, I think that Trade Architects might be able to respond to that at the moment. Trade, would you please? Um... Oh, yes. Let so, us know if you've heard that concern and let us know if you've done anything to respond. Yes, so, Diana has a lot of concerns um, with the way water is dealt with in the open area behind the house. And we have a very thorough code compliant, like what we think is just like a, a really good plan to deal with water on the site and make sure it's properly managed. It doesn't sound like it has been properly managed by the previous owner. And so you know, that's our goal to make sure everything's done correctly and properly managed. So we are definitely um, prepared to do that and have shared documents um, and met on site about it. I think there were a few last minute specific requests um, that the clients are still kind of, they, they just arrived last night. And I think the client just wants to take a moment to, to, you know, read through them and talk to Diane a little bit more, but they sound, I think the things that Diane is hoping happen are things that we were already, a lot of them are things we we're already planning to do and have already talked about. I think there was just 
there just needs to be a moment to um, have a little bit more communication about them. So I know I might be stepping out of line a bit. No, let me go. Um, would you be willing? And again, this is not this is subject to committee up in closed session. But if there are drainage problems in the adjacent property, um, in the building permit, you would be willing to stipulate that those will be addressed. But I just want I just want to be clear. So the comments. Wait a minute. Not... I ask a question to the architect. All right, but I am the attorney. Okay. Yes, I mean, I guess I I, I would love David to, to to comment on this as well. But the, the owners probably. of the property are planning to you know do everything to code um, and to deal with things correctly. And David. Would you like to add to that? Yeah, I just want to say like there's we're we're kind of new to what's being over the last couple of weeks about what the complaints are. There's you know how water works. There's no guarantee. We don't know where it's coming from. We just know that our design is going to be compliant with the codes. We're we we're, we're glad we're made aware of it. We're going to keep that in mind as we design and as we construct it. We're going to be also in in communicate. We've already been in communication with Judy as well um, regarding this, but. You know, you walk, you come in and the neighbor says, I've got all these water issues and it's your fault. Like it's only a couple of weeks and we're going to figure out where, if it is coming from our property, why it's coming from our property and make sure again, that we design this according to all codes, keeping in mind that we don't want there after they construct this, there to be an issue, to be a lawsuit, a dispute, have to disrupt everything again. So it's awesome that we know about it and we're going to move forward appropriately to make sure to the best of our abilities that you know that this address this should really address everything because right now you just got open brick and a shed roof and now you're going to have everything draining properly to code so if that makes sense um but there was a lot that came in yesterday and it was very specific about lateral loading and all kinds of it was very much engineering and very much nothing to do with zoning and that we're going to keep communicating with the neighbor about Really much appreciated, and you're correct. At this zone, at the zoning level, there's no, we we, we can't say anything. And uh, thank you for both of you for answering. I just want to say that sometimes it's really comforting to hear a technical answer. That's why I asked the architects. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any other comments from the public? I'm looking to see. Seeing none, I want to thank you, David and your team for a very complete presentation and we'll be back to you shortly. Oh, the dot, 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 when you tap it. Oops, hello? <laughs> Maybe somebody else has a public comment. Yeah. Nope. Uh, looks like Scott would like to speak. Oh, oh unmute. Scott, you're muted. Okay, Scott, you're unmuted. Let's go. Sorry, I'm new to this whole thing. No problem. <laughs> uh, I'm Scott Decker. I'm uh, Diana Hensley's husband. I live at 2403 uh, Panama. Um, I want to say, first of all, that Catherine and uh, the new neighbors have been very accommodating in addressing their concerns. Um, but this isn't some glib drainage issue. Um, as soon as... Uh, the previous owner's uh, previous owner's son started to prepare the house for sale. Uh, Tim Lilly, uh, when he removed the trash and uh, several plants from the courtyard, uh, that week we started getting about twenty-five to thirty-two gallons of water in our basement that I would uh, spend all night pumping out uh, with a shop vac. Uh, we've taken reasonable steps since then, uh, including a $12,000 drainage system uh, and a sump pump, uh, and uh, even allowing uh, Tim Lilly to build that little shed that they're going to take down uh, as a stopgap. Uh, I realize the architects uh, and the contractors are, are doing all they can within their job purview uh, to take care of this, but then again, the drainage problem may go beyond their purview. Um, we, we're not necessarily against it, but we have several uh, provisos. Um, Scott, we, let me quickly, I just don't understand what you just said. What do you mean it goes beyond their purview? Excuse me. 
What do you mean? <clears throat> as, as both Catherine and uh, the lawyer for uh, the neighbors were saying, that they're doing uh, everything they can. Um, and, and then they are, they're going above and beyond uh, within the scope of their job. The problem may be, however, that where their job ends, our problem may continue with the drainage. Um, and one of the provisos we may wanna make is, is that if it's feasible, uh, once we get some experts in to take a look at it, uh, that it may require uh, some additional additional work, which we've discussed with Catherine, and uh, she has made clear would be problematic, to say the least. Um, and once again, as the lawyer pointed out, it may not even alleviate the problem, but in my mind that if we were gonna take those steps, uh, now would be the time before any control. So I just wanna say, Scott, that uh, this committee uh, desires to be of service to the community. And I would, I'm requesting that Wade, Wade, could you please um, comment on our lack of, <laughs> or our ability to, if, whatever you wanna say to, uh, help uh, these th these two parties to resolve whatever technical ish drainage issue is going on. Uh, Wade, are, are you there? Can you help us here? I'm here. So with regard to this drainage issue, so just to clarify, what is the question again? Okay. Yeah. We have two people, adjacent neighbors, and since yeah. the property was purchased, um, there's uh, increased drainage problems on the adjacent neighbor. And yep. while the, I do, I, I'm going to strike out here and say that while the changes to the building are not objectionable, the drainage problems are, and it, it's not, well, is it or is it not the right time in the zoning process to, to get this resolved? Because in fact, we are granting a public good to the people who would like to do this thing that is not in compliance with the zoning code. We are not building code analysts, nor are we drainage analysts. Mm -hmm. And yet we are in put, put, we are put in a position of trying to resolve this. And I just want you to comment on that in general. And then of course the committee will discuss this in detail in a closed session, just to be yeah, transparent. So so, I mean, and I don't know if the applicant is willing to make any sort of side arrangements or, or deals with concerned neighbors. That is always an option that is oh, no separate from anything that, that we would do as a committee. Um, I will say that any concerns that are brought to our attention regarding the impact of this project on your neighbors is potentially relevant to how we uh, ultimately, we'll decide whether to oppose or not oppose this project. Um, but, um, and, and that obviously is going to be a, a concern that is, is raised and discussed internally. Um, but, you know, we would hope that if there are any side deals to be made, um, that, that the applicant would work with concerned neighbors to resolve them. Um, but, you know, we, we have very limited ability to enforce anything. So as long as we're all Clear so having, having heard from our fantastic lawyer, I just want to mention that knowing that this um, hearing date is in the future and knowing that these technical difficulties with water may or may not have anything to do with what you're proposing, um, if you engage the correct technical people to resolve that problem and we could find out that that was resolved, um, that might help us. And I would request that... Um, we don't want to hear the full case again because I would, well, I will leave it to the committee to decide that, but if, if, if we could find out in the future that, that the drainage concerns have been addressed, um, then we would be, you know, we will, we will be in a better position to make a decision. And I want to ask all, the applicant and the architect related to the applicant whether you're willing to engage those technical resources to find out what's going on. 
Uh, it's not something you have to answer yes or no. What I'm yeah. saying is you have time. We don't yeah, need to know yeah. the answer now. I would encourage you to do so. I mean, I can tell you right now, we we do have time and we have engaged and we will continue to engage. I think there's, you know, there's some people saying one thing, you know, there may or that may or may not be accurate, may not be, you know, well founded. We don't know. Again, you know, we'll continue to engage with them and we may or may not have an agreement as to, you know, how we think it should be handled versus how they should think it should be handled. But in the end, let's let's be crystal clear here what we're doing is going to undoubtedly certainly be compliant with all codes we are aware of this concern and it's undoubtedly going to be better than the situation that they've had and to be clear it was a situation before my clients purchased it not after by you know by scott's own statement it happened when the sun started clearing things so my clients it was happening before they got there they're aware of it but um but in the end, th this is going to be, you're going to be building over and sealing areas where water is presently uh, penetrating through the soil and possibly getting to their basement. So you're going to have, and off of those structures, you're going to have that stormwater properly controlled and properly diverted to the stormwater system per code, whereas right now it's just going down into the dirt. But we will continue because we do have time, which is awesome to continue to work with them and we will report back to you and you will let us know how, whether you want us to come back, whether, how you want to handle it, but yes. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to speak for the committee and then if I, if the committee overrules me, then I will get back to you. Okay. Uh, I, I would uh, ask you to find out what the real problem is uh, and then try, try. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And then if you resolved it and, and, yeah. and uh, you would just come back and let us know, we don't need to hear all the details about the design. No, 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 we went to, yeah. Or if we, can't resolve it, if we can't resolve it, we'll let you know as well. Okay. Well, as a committee member, Janice, I, I, I'm speaking to re overruling you, but- Thank you, you we, can. We, no, but I do <laughs> want for everybody who's listening to recognize, just to be clear, that there are a lot of codes and ordinances in the city of Philadelphia and the zoning code is only one. And there are many other codes that govern nuisance and water and other kinds of issues, and that we are not, it's not within our purview to be dealing with other, other codes. And exactly so, right. However, I will also say that one of the reasons we have this public process is to encourage people to work together. And I do believe, having heard everybody this evening, that we have that going on. And I thank you, both the applicant and the neighbor for engaging in this process. Yeah, nobody wants a lawsuit down the road, that's for sure. Have I heard from everyone? Oh, I think we have Scott, and Scott wants to respond. Do you oh, no. But no one wants a lawsuit later on. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Um, sorry about this. Okay. I believe we have heard from everyone on this case, and I want to thank you for a complete presentation, and I believe we can now move on to our last case. Thank you. Thank you fairly much. The next case is 151317 Pine Street, zoned RM1, ZBA case MI 2022-003148, hearing date 914-2022. Application for the erection of an attached structure 44, 46 feet, six inches high. Roof decks assessed by a pilot house with balconies, deck at seven levels at second floors with five accessory parking garages for two cars accessed by a shared driveway for multifamily household living and five dwelling units. Now, I would like to uh, first make sure that the applicant states the summary of the refusals. Well, as you know, we presented the David Orfanides presenting again. Um, if you're not sick of me yet, you will be. Um, I'm here for uh, Z1-1513 Pine LLC. Uh, we presented last month and um, the matter, I think following the, the subsequent meeting of the zoning committee after our presentation was to table the matter. Um, we only have one refusal, which has to do with height. As we mentioned, we took the buy right height and the um, height that we're proposing, which is consistent with the heights along Pine Street to the west of us, the building next to us and extending to the west of us, 
um, to the historic commission, um, the general consensus was that the maintaining the cornice line along Pine Street was preferred. Uh, the feedback we received with the tabling after last month's meeting was that I think the main one was the concern with the height and the effect on Hick Street. And so what we've what we've come back with and to try to be fairly narrow with this um, is to we we wanted to present and to show, I think the idea is what's this going to look like and you know what's it going to do to the the design of the project, the feel of the project, and and then what's the benefit of it? And so um, without going through, I mean, for those of you who, you know, weren't there at the last meeting, you know, real quickly, this is the parking lot on the northwest corner of South Hicks and Pine Street. It's been a parking lot, I won't say forever, but as far back as the zoning archives go, um, the Historic Commission has always had this as a parking lot. Here's some pictures you can see here in the middle uh, to the right. Um, as I mentioned, you've got some taller properties, um, you know, four story properties extending to the west of us. The idea was to maintain the general cornice line of those buildings. Um, and again, we took that to historic and they like that. That's what they like better than a 38 foot tall building, which if you see here. Excuse me one second. Let's go over here. Um, it right here drops the building lower, and you get a situation where it's it's not conti contiguous with the buildings next door. So the idea here was so what? But there it is taller than the buildings to the north of us on Hick Street, and the buildings across from us on Hick Street. Although further to the north of us, you have taller buildings on Spruce. So here's the, the design right now with what we're talking about. And then here's the design dropping. And, and our thought here is, wow, that, that really looks kind of weird. Um, you know, you do get a benefit of it lowering. I mean, it changes floor to ceiling heights. It just looks like this add-on appendage rather than the one can, nice continuous design um, and again, even though they call LNI calls this a multifamily, they started doing this a couple of years ago. These are five single family townhomes, each with the two car garage, again, with the share drive off the of Pine Street. Um, so it, again, our feeling is that it, you know, it just really, you know, it doesn't look great. And it, then we looked at the benefit and we did a shadow study you can see here in the spring fall equinox and you can say wow well, i can't tell here's a summer solstice and then what they did was they did a comparison between what we were proposing in a buy right and then they did a venn diagram and so here you can see the 38 foot the proposed building and there's a fairly minimal amount on the roof and extending over here of additional shadowing very small amount with, with this change. And then when you go to um, here, and then here you can see in the summer solstice, so back here is the spring fall equinox. And then here you have the summer, it's even less. And I have Gabe Deck from Gnome Architecture here who can go through this in greater detail and I can scroll through. And essentially, you know, when you look at it, it's not going to make that much difference in terms of shadowing. And we feel that it's just not a positive result in terms of design. And in the end, um, this is you know part of the reason why when we went to historic, the idea was you know to have the taller, overall taller. We did talk about stepping it down, and and here you have the result of that. Um, Gabe, would you like to add anything to this? Or Tom, you know, your thoughts or anything that I didn't touch on? Because again, this idea was to come back and to try to address this question um, you know, regarding the Hick Street properties. Yeah, no, I think you summed it up nicely, uh, David. Um, and this is Gabe Deck of Gnome Architects. Uh, you know, this, the, the aesthetic and the design of this project you know, has really been to kind of um, pay homage to kind of the classical, you know, order of the Philadelphia row home and the, the, the kind of like the brownstone feel of, of, of Pine Street there. So 
creating a lot of uniform horizontal bands and window alignments and such is, is kind of the driving concept here. Um, so, you know, looking at kind of stepping down that final unit, it really kind of disrupts and breaks up the whole kind of concept for it. Uh, so, you know, we feel strongly that it would be a much more cohesive look to maintain that cornice height. And, and was I accurate in my, my lay person's um, communication of the shadowing and like the minimal difference between the two? Um, yeah. So the, the Venn diagram, you overlaid the two shadows between the proposed and the by right 38 foot height. Um, and I believe you didn't even put the build up the deck or the pilot house. You kept those a little bit lower than what they would otherwise be. But that the difference in shadowing is is pretty minimal, and where and where it's located, the effect is is pretty uh, non consequential as well. Correct. So I mean, on the the far left side in blue is kind of the shadow projected by a by right, you know, thirty eight foot roof height, um, you know, and then the middle section is the proposed uh, uniform height design. Uh, the Venn diagram on the right. Uh, the the kind of delta between those are those red areas, and they are all shadows that are cast on the roof of three three thirty four Hicks. Um, and so that you know there's negligible impact for any of the open space or rear yard um, between the two uh, approaches. Great, thanks, Gabe. I mean, I can go back into the you know into the you know the full presentation, but. I don't um, think that's necessary. I don't, Thank I don't you. think I was hoping you would say that, and I didn't think so either. I was trying to be concise. So Thank you. Uh, hopefully we've answered the, the questions, uh, the concern or the question that was raised. Well, before we go to the committee's questions, I will mention that there was another comment that I would like the architect to respond to. Sure. And that sure. Would be, um, there was a suggestion to move the entry on one of two Pine Street. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> So, and, you know, I can just have Gabe talk about that. Gabe, if you if you want to go, where do you want me to start here on the floor plans? Yeah, this why don't you? This is from the prior meeting. Now, I'm not saying this was a, com a comment interstitial. It was from the prior right. meeting directly. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I forgot that one. So, yeah, go ahead. Gabe, do you want to start with here or you want to start with the floor plans? Because I think it's kind of driven by the floor uh, plans. Yeah, you can start right here. I mean, you know, we, we really wanted to keep... Um, you know, the pilot houses off of the, you know, as far away from the street as possible. As you can see here in this rendering, they're, they are not visible at all um, from across the street, which is kind of the furthest vantage point. So, um, you know, if you go to the floor plans on page, uh, page 10. Hold on a second, sorry, I'm not doing a very good job of being Vanna here. I just want to make one comment is in that the elevation that you're showing on Hicks Street will yeah. never be viewed. Whereas the the elevation that you're showing on Pine Street is completely visible and very prominent. I'm, it's, I'm it's sorry. Deceiving. What I'm saying is that the, the elevation that, that is being shown on Hicks Street will never be viewed because Hicks Street is very narrow. Whereas the elevation you're showing on Pine Street is significant and very viewable and part mm -hmm. of the vocabulary of the street going down Pine. Correct. Okay. I, yes, I agree. So here's the, there's the corner yeah. unit. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the, the, the challenge here with these layouts is really to provide the two car parking um, for each unit. This is the corner unit layout. Um, you know, the street intersection would be at the bottom left-hand corner of each of these floor plans. So you have the cellar on the far left, first floor in the middle, second on, on the far right. Um, so, you know, we, we looked at kind of reorganizing things, um, you know, and uh, to get the entrance off of the, Pine Street side, and it really came down to, you know, one, we either have to flip the staircase and the elevator that communicate through the upper floors to the Pine Street side, um, which would put the pilot house on the, on the Pine Street side, um, you know, or, or it would just disrupt the plan in that we would have to separate the elevator from the uh, staircase, which you know, that relationship of the direct adjacency on the third and fourth plan for third and fourth floors is critical uh, for the bedroom layouts. Um, so, you know, we looked into it and we, you know, would like to have that situation as well, but it just wasn't 
feasible from a layout standpoint. So, so the the pro to summarize, the issue is is that if we put the if we put the door over here. like even say like if you flipped it put the elevator here and put where the where the closet is would be where the door is so this goes over here the problem is then the stairs go have to go over to this side and if they go over to this side the problem is with the elevator over here you have to flip after the third floor i guess right gave after the third floor if not the second floor you have to flip because the elevator now would be on this side right here with the door below it, you know, all the way down the grade. Now mm -hmm. I have to flip this over and now you have the pilot house um, out at Pine Street. So um, I'm not going to speak for the committee, but if we did have the pilot house out at Pine Street and we got the better street grade design, would you be objection? Would you object? I mean, we'd have to take it. We'd have to. I think we'd have to take it back. Well, historic, it's only commentary, which is good news, I mean, and it yeah, is commentary. Yeah. Yeah, but you, is, your hearing is. date is 9 14, 2022. Yeah, yeah. So, we, I mean, it, it is commentary. So, I mean, in the end, they and, couldn't and again, force us. Nothing, the committee has not commented. No, I understand. I mean, Tom, Tom, this is your project, and Gabe, you're the architect. I mean, other than putting that pilot house, you know, right out on pine street you know so you're talking about i mean you know correct me if i'm wrong you're looking at you know something oops yep something like up in this ballpark yeah the the you know window and kind of the, the bay element that's there as well would, would need to be you know redesigned and you probably wouldn't have as much uh organization going on on that um elevation as well so that would that would completely change would it push some of those getting to floor plans now? If you had the stairs, let me just say this: I, I don't want to. We don't want to get into the design of it. I, I think that um, when we get into committee, I'll be able to con convey the impact okay. on your unit, which will okay. it will ruin the unit, uh, and we'll talk about all that. And we'll talk about the whole project. So, let me just defer and get out of the <laughs> get out of the conversation and just let my committee go ahead and ask their questions. And we have um, Ben W. first. Yeah, thanks for the consideration on the redesign attempts. First of all, uh, my only question, just to remind me, it was purchased a lot this year. And what was the hardship from the last meeting that was presented? So, so there is, let's just put it this way. I don't know that there's a hardship other than the fact that we went to historic and we, you know, we started, this started out as a buy right design. And, you know, Gabe or Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm recollecting this or recalling this incorrectly. But then when they got into the design, it just, it was looked off. Like it just was this drop off from Pine Street. So the idea was they took the extra time to go to historic, to get an opinion as to, because they were, we were thinking like it, they were thinking it, it looks better if you're consistent with the Pine Street elevations to the West. And they're going through this whole process because they think, you know, it's not a hardship. Other than the fact, I mean, I guess you could argue that it's a hardship because if you look at the Valley View case and you have all the other properties along Pine Street at a certain height, and this is maintaining that, it's the fabric of the block and the way the other buildings are. Um, so from a case law standpoint, you could argue that. But, you know, we're also looking at the fact of, you know, we live in the city, you were trying to make a building, a new building that fits in. The design is borrowing a lot of historic elements, but making them modern. And we went to the historic commission, even though it's advisory, to see what their thoughts are on it. In the end, the consensus was, yeah, we like the taller building. And so we're going through the variance process to try to make a building that everybody thinks kind of looks better than what a buy right building would look like. But again, I think that I think that could be argued that there is a hardship given the height of the other buildings on Pine Street. Are you guys familiar with the project that went up uh, a few years ago at 22nd and Walnut? It's a very similar circumstance. 22nd and, uh, well, yeah, I mean, are those the one that's a caddy corner from the gas station, right? Correct. And I, I mean, I haven't studied that, and I don't know, are those 
were they lining up with the buildings to the south or the they were lining with the buildings on Walnut Street? Yeah, again, two different elevations from Walnut and then down 22nd. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I'm familiar with it. I get gas there and I look at it. Um, I know that those are, you know, very white, modern structures, whereas these are, you know, kind of much more a modern version of a contemporary structure. And a lot of time was spent mimicking or lining up banding and windows with the buildings to the west of us. I don't know how that building, what efforts were made to line up that building with even with the Walnut Street properties. Um, but this is all driven by my clients taking the extra time, making the extra effort, spending the extra amount of money on people like me and as architect to try to do a project that, you know, we, you know, everybody's kind of the general, not everybody, I can't say that, that's not fair, that's incorrect. But that generally with the idea, the consensus has been that lining it up with Walnut Street, I mean, Walnut Street, you know, you got me saying Walnut, lining up with the buildings that are on Pine Street um, ends up with a design that's better, uh, looks better, feels better, um, it's better for the city. And, um, and that the benefit of dropping the buildings to the north um, maybe aren't seemingly worth the um, worth the change in terms of at least in terms of shadowing. All right, uh, Ben, did you complete your your questioning? All right, thank you. Let's go on to Rick. I have a pretty simple question, and that is, we saw the shadowing study for the equinoxes, but what about the uh, winter solstice? What does the Venn diagram look like for the solstice? <laughs> So, Gabe, we didn't do a Venn for very, that. The very final page. Um, and and we didn't right. blow it up only because it was only impacting some shadow on the roof structures. There was no impact any like ground um, open area. So in other words, the, the shadows are already so big that that change doesn't impact them right. except on the roof line. Could you show that to us? I mean, I just want to make sure yeah. that where Sorry. would the red be um, on here? How can we picture this? So, so here's the proposed, here's the 38 foot building. Right. I mean, Gabe, I don't know if you want to do it, but I mean, here you can see, so there's shadowing all back here, same as here. So there's a little bit, it looks like this part comes up, oops, right here on the roof here. And this, there's a part here on the roof, and then it's a little different, slightly different shape right here. Okay. Um, in terms because of here, you're... here it looks like we're shadowing a little more here, yeah. a little more like right in here. Um, but because then there's, there's no difference the south, because it's coming from the south, right? Um, it's it's just really not affecting the the buildings across the street on Hex. No. No. Um, though at noon, yeah, there really isn't much difference either. No, I think you can see like here it cuts across. I mean, oddly, here the proposed, there's a little sliver like of actual light, additional light here that's not up here on 30 foot, but you can see this this angles across right here. Yeah. This angles across here. And then other than that, um, there's additional shadowing on this lower roof here. But other than that, everything else is in shadow because the building in its rear, in terms of a rear yard, because the sun's so low, it's all shadowing itself. And the buildings are all shadowing the open area regardless. So I think in both, Gabe, would it be safe to say in both circumstances that the additional shadowing to the extent that there is at certain times of day and not at others is just on the roofs of these of these gabled roofs, which I think we all know the, you know, or I know we don't all know, but I know from personal experience, the likelihood of the historic commission on any of those structures of getting a roof deck are pretty slim to none. I would agree with that. Thank you. All right, where are we? Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, are there any questions for the public? Go 
all right, we have introduced the idea that you might want to think about this Pine Street exposure, and we will not be designing this for you. Uh, I just want to say that, and we will take all of this into advisement if you want to make any final comments as to your willingness to think about the Pine Street elevation. They would that your any of your comments would be most welcome. I mean, I, I just wanted to add one thing in looking at it. And again, I'm not the architect, and I know you said you don't want to design it, but Gabe, if I we flip the stairs over to this side, I mean, you've got you've got bedrooms on this side that I mean, what how do we get air natural air into and light into those built oops, sorry into those bedrooms now if they have to now go to the back wall. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole layout would, would just really need to get reconfigured. Um, you know, I can't speak to if we'd end up with the same kind of open space that we have in the top left corner. Um, you know, it, it would be a detriment to the layout for sure. For sure. So Gabriel, I have another, I, I just want to ask you some other uh, questions related to what we are going to be discussing. Looking at the Pine Street Elevation again, if you could put that up on the screen, is there yeah. anything you can do to improve that elevation? Because it, 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 what you've done is create this wonderful, beautiful thing facing Hicks Street, yet you know, Pine Street has been, you know, it's a poor child. Anything you can offer, again, before we have to go into deliberations? I mean, we, we, we've gone to lengths to make sure the windows that we can provide on that side within the staircase at the front corner as well as in the garage where you don't normally have a, you know a whole lot of window um, to keep to make those as large as possible um, we could we could consider enlarging those further for additional glazing um, you know with and and do our best to, to maintain kind of the alignments and the order of the windows above uh, we can take another look at that Thank you so much for, for explaining that to us. And also thank you for your complete presentation of this project. Thank you. Okay. I believe that completes our agenda, except for our committee members. Yes. <clears throat> Um, one last item to mention, if I can. Yeah, sure. Certainly. Would it be helpful at all if we were to, you know, try to provide a door uh, from the garage directly onto uh, Pine Street where, you know, we can dress it up and really kind of treat it as, you know, emulating kind of a, a, an entrance um, and provide a bit more uh, you know, immediately addressing that frontage with with it. Yeah, that's a great idea, and I thank you for that. Yeah, I you you get what what where we're like what, what what we're talking about. I mean, Pine Street is beloved. Sure. So I, I, maybe I something, something over in this area here, or I mean. Well, we won't be designing it again. Okay. We're not going to be designing this. For okay, you. but some maybe some type of some type of door along the Pine Street entrance for whatever purpose in whatever location. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, we can look at adding planner boxes and you know dressing it up like we are on Hex. Thank okay. you. All right, cool. All right, so um, All right. with that, Good um, idea. we're gonna thank you for everyone who's not on the committee. The, now we'll be conducting our private session and again, good night. Wait, we oh, have so sorry, can I ask one quick question um, if, I, if I may? Certainly, Megan, did you not get, did I not give enough public comment? No, no, not at all. I'm so sorry. I was waiting until everything was concluded because I um, had a question about the continuance for the ambrosia issue at the beginning that we talked about at the very beginning of the meeting is now oh, an okay hey. time to ask a quick clarifying Absolutely. question. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, because the ZBA hearing is next week at 2 p.m., uh, my neighbors and I are really un like we're not sure what's going to happen now because I thought that if it's tabled for discussion, then it would come up next month in the zoning committee meeting. But the ZBA hearing is next week at 2 p.m. Mm. So any advice you could offer about what what do we do then? Like what is the process from now on? Um, so Wade yeah. Wade Albert, 
who is our attorney is going to interrupt me, but I will tell you what the process will be. Um, after our committee is going to deliberate and decide whether to oppose or not to oppose. And Wade will be representing us at that hearing. So, so if, should it go if, forward? If the applicant, sure, if the applicant said that he was going to continue, that's not just a continuance in front of us, but it would also be a continuance in front of the ZBA. So we have not made a decision yet, and we will not make a decision until our next meeting when they present again. So I am sure, and I know the attorney um, who represents the applicant, we've dealt with him before on many issues in the past. Uh, we will follow up with him to confirm that he will be asking the ZBA for a continuance. Um, and in the very unlikely event that he does not, uh, we ourselves would ask the ZBA for a continuance because we have not made our decision. But either way, um, I do not foresee that this case will be heard on the merits at the ZBA. Oh, thank you. That's really state. that's that's really helpful. Thanks. So then uh, I don't Ma Megan, come to this Megan, ZBA. Megan, yeah. I, I would be, I'm, I'm, I'm an attorney by trade, but I'm a member of the committee, but I couldn't sleep if I didn't say to you, you or somebody should go to that zoning board hearing and confirm for yourself what Wade yeah. is saying is what he predicts okay. based on go. very good go. experience. Go. But somebody should go there to be sure. I will go. I will go. Thank you so much for that advice. That's what I was planning on doing anyway, but you've just Thank confirmed you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much. I believe that now we have our committee in front of us. Nice. So I just want to say that's why we're the best. Oh, I don't want to brag. It's my last evening sharing, but we are the best RCO ever. <laughs> print t-shirts. the recording. I, I, I totally agree with that. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> and we have the best chairs. Mm, I'm going to stop the recording now. So Janice, can we take a short